Good morning. Well, wait, where are you, by the way? Are you in England right now? I am in England. Yeah, in the just just uh, in the south of England, just outside of Brighton. Yeah, I was just thinking, man. 9 a.m. How rock and roll is 9 a.m. And then I realized, oh wait, he's in England. Yeah. Time difference. Wait a minute. But even then, how rock and roll is 5 p.m. <laughs> Very rock and roll. I've just woken up, so uh, no. <laughs> no, man. It's uh, it's, it's funny. I, this is kind of how I spend my days now, chatting to all sorts of people from around the world on on Zoom. It's uh, it's actually really cool. I really enjoy it. You know what's funny is I know you're from Brighton, and uh, and I was thinking, oh, this is cool because I used to play there as a kid, but then I realized. Hold on, that's New Brighton. That's different. Oh, yeah. yeah, this is Old Brighton. Yeah, I grew up on Merseyside. So I, I, I really, yeah, uh, yeah. That's really cool. Man. Yeah, my mom's from Liverpool, dad from South London. And uh, when, when they lived here in the States, and then they, they split, and my mom took me and my sister back to Liverpool. And oh. so all my earliest memories are of, uh, you know, of, of, I know you don't want to, I know you don't want to see or hear this, but. Yeah, well, I was just about to ask. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, it's probably not something you want to see or hear right at this moment. Um, no, not so much. I could erase the last five weeks, probably. It's been strange, hasn't it? I, I think they're psychologically exhausted, the Liverpool team. I think, you know, they did so well to, to win the league last year, the Champions League the year before, with the whole COVID thing going on. I think they just look, they look exhausted to me. They look shot. And to lose Van Dyke, I think that's a, that's a big one as well for, for a whole season. That's that's a tough one. How did you become an Arsenal fan, by the way? That's a really good question. Funnily enough, my dad is from the States. Uh, he's from New Jersey originally. Oh, okay. Um, so I was, and, and he has absolutely no idea about soccer, football at all. Uh, so I was sort of born into a, an ocean of footballing uncertainty and I just kind of had to pick a team. So uh, I watched Arsenal in the FA Cup in 1991, I think I must have been about eight, and they beat Sheffield Wednesday. So I thought, yeah, all right, let's do this. And uh, and that the rest is history. Yeah. Nice decor in the background. Looks nice. Got some nice colors there. Got the plant over there. Are you a decorator? Or is this all you, or somebody else coming to do this? Uh, I had a little bit of help. Yeah. I mean, the the main thing is the coffee machine for me. Like I, you know, I'm a big coffee fan, big coffee snob actually. So getting the That's coffee like. Right. That's a legit. It's it's a little bit serious. It's not like it's not like crazy made in Italy kind of legit, but it's it's good. It's it's it makes strong and good coffee, and that's really the main thing. Like you're you're pouring the beans in. That's a process for a cup of coffee. Why not just grab like the pod coffee things? It's not quite the same. No. Taste wise, and also I just don't like the thought of where all those pods are ending up. To be honest. It's a bit of a dark thought. That's a lot of landfill. So, yeah, it's uh, and, you know, you can get all sort of snobby about the beans that you buy. You can go into like hipster coffee shops and stroke your facial hair and talk about sort of the nuances of the beans. And uh, yeah. you know, that's uh, that's an enjoyable pastime. Speak. That's fun. I get that. I mean, this is L.A., man. That's we, we have a lot of yeah. those coffee shops that are that yeah. are into that. But so you don't like the taste of the burnt plastic. That's probably a good thing. Yeah. Weird, huh? Yeah. Huh. Huh. <laughs> Um, yeah. live alone, just you, you're not, you're not married, right? You're a single guy. I'm not married. No, I've, I've not found a, a woman to uh, take pity on me yet. Um, yeah, single guy and actually sort of went through a breakup not long before lockdown. Uh, so I've sort of had the double whammy of, uh, heartache and, uh, confinement, which is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, an interesting cocktail, uh, for a few months. It is. That's pretty heavy. I mean, it's it's getting to know yourself already alone like that and then trying to mourn a relationship is quite a bit. Yeah, but you know what, man? Creatively, it's been such a fruitful time. I think, you know, I'm not the first singer-songwriter to write a lot of songs around such painful uh, situations. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever written quite so many songs as I have in lockdown and, and, and the quality of them, I feel like has been really high as well. So mm. if there's one silver lining, it's definitely been, been the songwriting. Your notes in your phone must be just going crazy. Is that how you kind of do it? You kind of write down. Yeah. And I haven't labeled any of them. So they all <laughs> say the same thing. And then just like number one, two, three, four. So it's like, God knows what's in there. It's an absolute mess. That's actually a really funny idea to do for the album. And don't even name them. Just be like note yeah. one, note two, note three. Exactly. Maybe I'll do that. Just call it notes. Wow, so I'm I get some points on this album. I'm very nice. I like <laughs> it.
is, is one day marriage and kids the plan or, and I ask because for me, it never was that happily ever after didn't include marriage and kids. So. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think until you find the person that it all makes sense with, you know, until you're like, yeah, of course you brilliant, amazing little versions of us. Fantastic. Until that moment happens, I think it's all a bit ambiguous and hypothetical. So yes, I would, I, would, I love the idea of it. Uh, I'm getting slightly old and grizzled now, so it probably needs to happen fairly soon if it's going oh, to. Stop it. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You're a young man. You're a young man. You're about to have your, your second quarantine birthday as well. Oh, that's so depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who's dressing you? Because I love the, how you dress, your outfits and stuff like that. You know, even flipping through just even your Instagram. I love the way you dress. Is that is that you? <laughs> Thanks very much. I think you're the first person to ever comment on that. It is me. It's all it's all my handiwork. Uh, I buy shirts and jeans and then wear them in different combinations. That's the secret. Uh, yeah, and always the same pair of Converse. I'm. I feel like I'm a, a fairly uh, unadventurous dresser, but I really appreciate the compliment, man. Thank no, you. I don't think that's true at all, man. I think you have a really nice style and. Uh... Even even the cut of your jeans is incredible. I'm like obsessed with the, the the taper of them, the cut of them, and the thighs. Everything is like really nice. Wow. Yeah, you've, you've really done your visual homework, man. I appreciate. Yeah, that. or somebody photoshopped the hell out of those pictures and and made them look. Super yeah, maybe nice. maybe my management team are doing that without me knowing. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, these thighs aren't what they used to be. Yeah, well, mine either, man. You still spending let her go money? Is that is that still running things right now? I mean, that song is just bonkers. I, when I wrote that song, I was busking around Australia. I was playing in pubs every night and playing on street corners in the daytime. I wrote that song in 45 minutes uh, backstage at this little pub. God. And I never, I, I wrote it so quickly that I, was, I liked it and uh, I thought, yeah, that's a nice song. But it wasn't even within my universe of possibilities that it could go on to be a commercial success. So um, I don't quite know where to start with that song. And it, and it just keeps on going, you know, like it's, I think, up to 3 billion views on YouTube yeah. now and over a billion streams. And it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. And the best thing actually about that song, and I truly mean this, is the fact that it's got so big, it's kind of reached every corner of the world. And still today, like, I get messages from, like, Tibet and, like, Nigeria and... Paraguay, all over the world, kind of people saying how much this song means to them. They played it at their wedding or a funeral, or it got them out of the, you know, of a slump or feeling depressed or whatever. It's just, it is that is mind blowing to me, man. Wow, that is at, so cool. At a wedding, that doesn't seem the appropriate place for that yeah. song, does it? Yeah, you know what? I have thought that when I get the <laughs> wedding ones, it's like it mm. sounds a little bit like you're not sure about getting married. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if I was the bride, I'd be like, "Why did why did you choose this?" Yeah, that's what that's what's going on during that first dance conversation. Yeah, like, and like the whole wedding's in tears. It's like you've completely ruined this. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they're uh, I wonder if they're almost thrown off because that song is kind of on a positive chord, isn't it? As depressing yeah. of a song, but it's on a maybe that's what it is. They've been and that's what I like to do. I like to lull people into a sense of oh, this is actually quite pleasant. And then once you listen to the lyrics, like oh no, it's not. It's actually very, very depressing and sad. And now I'm in tears. And that's my job. It's weird because, you know, as a guy, I don't know if it's a guy thing or not, but I, I tend to listen to the the music, you know, first. Melodies, yeah. chords, especially. I love uh, orchestras and scores and stuff. But then cool. after a few listens, eventually you listen to the lyrics and that's where you go, wait, what? That's and really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it always fascinates me how, how different people approach music within my band as well, you know, talking to the drummer, talking to the bass player, talking to the, the guitar player. It's like, they all just listen for, for that element first. And I find that fascinating that a drummer will listen to a song and it's like, all I can hear is what the drums are doing. And then if, as you say, eventually, you know, after a few listens, you start to kind of come out of that and, and hear the song as a whole. I love that, man. I think that's so interesting. I, for me, it's, I'm obsessed with lyrics. I'm an absolute nerd with lyrics. Like I grew up listening to, yeah, John Prine and Joni Mitchell and so many great songwriters. And I don't know, I, th I think when, you, when you're able to couple 
powerful lyrics with a beautiful melody, something extraordinary happens in the, in the human brain. It's such a powerful combination. And I'm obsessed with trying to get that right. Yeah. It's something special. Sometimes it can take quite a while to get through a song because you have to keep rewinding and listening to even how certain words sit on a certain chord. And uh, I mean, I grew up listening to, I mean, for me, it's Peter Gabriel and, awesome. and, and Sting and stuff. So for Peter Gabriel, first of all, the music is just wide and airy and insane. Oh, and, half the t and half the time, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. So I, I know I have to dissect that later. Yeah. He, uh, I'm, I'm a fairly re like recent, I say recent, like within the last 10 years, like getting into Peter Gabriel and that guy is a genius and the tone of his voice, aside from anything else, aside from the production, which is absolutely spotless and the songwriting and everything else, the tone of that guy's voice just is utterly untouchable. It's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Are you a little hyper aware of the way other people listen to it? Like, are you setting certain sounds in the background, like ambient noises for the people who may listen to it a certain way or? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I've got better at that as well. And the more records you make, this is my 13th album now. And I think, I think you just kind of, you learn with every album, you learn with every record and you, and you take that experience into the next one. And so I, I do think, yeah, I think musically it's, it's richer, it's more interesting. It's, I think, back in the day it was i was yeah as i said so 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 sort of sort of keyed into the lyrics and 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 that kind of thing maybe that took center stage too much but i th i think there is a musical world now big thanks to my producer and my band as well you know they're they're so brilliant i'm so lucky to to work with those guys and they come in and add such a so many layers and such a, a diverse musical world to to what i do so it's uh, yeah it's it's fun well, and when you say your band, that's that's a little confusing for some people as well, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because I don't know what the hell to call you sometimes. And but I do know uh, two one thing: your fans are super comfortable just calling you Mike. And yeah, is that okay? That's all right with you. Yeah. It is okay. Yeah, it's a funny one. Like if someone yeah. stops me in the street, they often call me passenger because you know it's like, oh my god, are you passenger? It's like kind of. Um, <laughs> the passenger started as a band like years and years ago as a five piece and we released an album and, and toured a bit. This was sort of back in the early 2000s and for, for a sort of plethora of reasons, it didn't quite work out. And I ended up kind of going off on my own and doing my, my solo project. And at the time, I just remember thinking, do I just call myself Mike Rosenberg now or do I stick with Passenger? And there was, there was something about Passenger that firstly, I didn't want to kind of lose the small fan base that we'd sort of amassed at that stage. Mm. but also, there are so many male singer songwriters that use their given names. And I just kind of remember feeling like actually Passenger just kind of gives it something slightly different. It gives it a ambiguity and a bit of a mystique. Um, mm. So I just, yeah, I stuck with it. And I'm really glad I did because I think over the years I've really grown into that name, you know, with the way that I've traveled and, and busked and played and, and the sort of observational style of songwriting. I, I actually think it really kind of fits the name now. But you're totally right. It is completely baffling to most people because is it a band? Is it a guy? Like right. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Yeah. But it, but you know what's crazy about it too is the fact that people do connect it as a band. But you as a solo artist have been around longer than the band actually even was. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the band was only about for four or five years. And yeah. You still um, talk to any of those guys, by the way? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm still in touch with all of them, and every now and again we go for a for a dinner and a drink. And uh, actually, funnily enough, Andrew um, played some guitar for us on a recent album as well. So yeah, it's, they, they all still live in Brighton. Like they're, they're my boys, they're, they're great. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't right for any of us that set up. And, and it wasn't some sort of, you, you know, acrimonious split, you know, uh, it was just kind of the right moment for all of us to be like, you know what, this isn't quite right, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we've all remained friends and it's, it's not a sort of, um, rock and roll as, as as some people would like to think yeah <laughs> yeah i was gonna say i want to hear about feuds and i want to hear at a yeah. pub and you're fighting at 2 30 in the morning i wish i wish i could tell you those things <laughs> uh, it, it was all very sort of middle class and english and polite um but yeah it's uh it's nice man i i, I think music's like that you know it's, it's a bit like life you know you go through life and for a time you and another person or a group of friends are, are so close and you're so relevant to each other and 
you're in the same place and you're in this on the same page and naturally you know you end up drifting away you end up doing other things and it and it's nothing personal it's nothing bad it's just the the evolution of things really so uh, yeah music's very very like that right the chances of two people growing through life uh, you know on a parallel is pretty i mean especially right now i mean oh my god how many people have you cut out of your life in the past eight ten months yeah i don't know <laughs> i haven't thought about that i mean it's yeah. yeah it's difficult just not hanging out with people mm. um so yeah I, I guess you've got to cultivate that kind of digital friendship with everyone mm. um, mm -hmm. which can be exhausting right like you know not having that real like just actual human hangouts I find really tiring and, and the thought of a zoom even with my best mates after you know a day of work it's like you know what i can't i just want to zone out and watch netflix it's sad it's interesting though because you, you guys are pretty much staying home right now right for the most part yeah. yeah yeah so you work at home and then now you're just is it is it maybe that you're getting too good at being alone and at home that's an interesting thought. too comfortable with that yeah, and I, th I think we all have. I think we've all sort of adjusted to this um, to an extent, you know, like you have to. Uh, it's going to be interesting when this eventually ends and we're allowed to kind of go out and, and mingle and, and socialize. And it'll be, it'll be super interesting to see how people, how comfortable people are with that initially. Yeah. Uh, who it's knows? Be like a kid running out in the playground going, insecure i don't know what to do i don't know what to say to people in person and oh my that's god that's how i felt my whole life actually so that's yeah that's, that's fine yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean i i feel that for sure i definitely uh definitely am uh, you know home alone as well to myself mm -hmm. but not being a, around people is probably the easiest part of this and it sounds terrible but yeah but at some point you realize wow i'm, I'm way too good at this yeah yeah this yeah is, this is probably mean. not good i know what you mean yeah Thank God for Zoom. And here you are. You're in my house. Is this weird? I'm in your house. Welcome. <laughs> it's, um, weird. it's not weird anymore, is it? I, I no. kind of, you know, and and as you said at the start of this, you know, like the reality of doing a, a, a promo run before this was like literally flying and traveling and driving all over the world. Like it's exhausting. It's expensive. It's knackering. Like you're in a hotel room. You're in a tour bus. You're somewhere. And you spend months doing it and actually like to be able to just to you know like today i've spoken to like maybe eight people from eight different countries and no kidding and it's, and it's comfortable and everyone's at their in their home and it's it's this thing of like i don't know i have to say like i think there's something pretty amazing about it it's great i mean i'm in your sweat are you wearing sweats do you even have pants on for god's sakes i do i you know what I, <laughs> i've definitely I done the sort of sweats yeah. beneath the camera thing absolutely <laughs> uh you're you you should you should feel special i've, I've got some jeans on today I've, I've have pretty, you pretty yeah i've really gone there i was like this is this is a big interview i don't want to i don't want to be in my tacky buttons very well hanging on you got your jeans on i have to know for my own self-serving reason what brand are your jeans they're nudie uh which is uh, oh I yeah yeah Scandinavian gene yeah the um okay. I'll, I'll send you a link to the i'm not sure which fit or cut or whatever but I'll, uh, I'll send you a link to it man they're definitely a skinny cut because i they're just the way they're for and, and sorry to sound totally obsessed with that but oh it's cool but yeah talking to people all of these countries and it's it's got to be cool to see i don't know how much time you get to spend on your on your comments and stuff on instagram but you've got these fan groups in other like uruguay and brazil mm -hmm. and argentina it's mind-blowing and it, and it goes back to what i was saying about sort of getting messages from people you know and i'm not i'm not trying to sound sort of um I don't know. It, it genuinely is the best part about this. Genuinely knowing that, that the music that I'm sort of writing at my kitchen table sort of goes into this machine and then comes out the other end and is an album. And then that goes across the world, and especially with Spotify and YouTube and the way that music is being consumed now. You know, it really does get to everywhere. And that's such an exciting feeling for an artist. I think, you know, there's there's lots of, there's lots of weird things about, you know, the modern music industry. There's some things that aren't ideal for artists, but the fact that you can upload something yourself to Spotify and that is then potentially out there in the world and meaning the world, not just sort of certain markets or certain territories. It's like, that's, that's there for everyone to listen to. That's, 
that is a really exciting thought for for a music maker i think yeah and i would think for these countries who english isn't even a main language for them but they they still latch on to an english artist like that or you know an english speaking artist like that i was i was south america specifically i was very lucky to to tour there with ed sheeran in 2019 i'd never been to south america before i've always wanted to it was, it was really the part of the world that I, I hadn't spent any time in and uh and yeah i got to go and play these massive shows with with ed like stadium shows in sao paulo and buenos aires and montevideo and and it was just incredible. I mean, like those guys are wild. Like they're such <laughs> cool audiences. Like, it's just so loud, so joyful, so welcoming. Um, and then after the Ed shows, I, I sort of snaked around and did my own shows for a month or so when we got to Peru and Chile and Colombia and Mexico. And man, it was such a wonderful experience. And, um, you know, it, it blew my mind that I would turn up in like Bogota. I'd never been there before. And like there'd be 1500 people in this theater, it's a sold out show coming to see my music. And uh, that's humbling, man. That is truly humbling. And yeah. to have them, like I said, not even speaking English, but singing your song back, that's gotta be, there has to be that moment where you're on the stage going, what the hell? Yeah, how, what how happened? How do you know this? Yeah, and actually for me, you know, as much as I talk about, you know, the streaming numbers and the views and all that kind of stuff, it's much more tangible for me to go and stand in a room in, in Lima and play to a couple of thousand people who, who know my music. That's what means something to me. That's, that's the real, that's what's real about all of this, you know? That's... Sure. Sure. They're there because they want to be there as opposed to just finding something to do on a, on a Saturday night. And exactly. it really shows in like, um, when I was flipping through, like even the comments, when you, when you put the album art artwork up, I mean, not only the things that they're saying, which really funny, by the way, there's some, they have some really creative ways of telling you that they love you. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's if if you could add another song in this album where you sing for maybe six or seven hours nonstop, that would be great. No pressure though. <laughs> and, sure. Yeah, it's funny, but when you when when you start to click on the 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 names of the people and seeing who these people are, I mean, you've got a lady here who is at a, t a picture of her and her kid at a, at a football match, and or yeah. this guy over here who's surfing somewhere, who knows where. And it's it's really interesting when you go a little deeper on just the uh, the, the different types of people. I mean, you're 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 just yeah, and, and and that's something I've always been proud of as well. You know, I think the demographic at a passenger gig is so varied. It's yes. it's whole spectrum, and I, I I don't know where that's come from. Whether it's sort of the busking origins or whatever, or, or the songs that I write seem to. Hopefully, this is what I hope is that it's yeah, it, it's. It's possible that those songs can can speak to to various members of society. You know, it's not just kind of speaking to a very specific demographic. But I'm always really proud of that, man. I'm I'm proud that you know, people's kids like it and their parents like it and their grandparents like it. And there's this sometimes there's this real kind of family thing with Passenger, which I'm re really proud of. And you know, if if a family comes together uh, over my music, you know, again, it's those moments that that make this really special for me. Because in your mind, I mean, you're on stage and you're playing. That's pretty much what you see is the people in the crowd. So in a way, everybody, that's, your audience are the people sitting in that row and that row and that row. But then when you, you know, you open up their accounts and you see, oh, this is this guy, whoever this guy is, Chris, who left you a comment. He's just, there he is with his friend hiking on a trail somewhere. What a lot. I love just, it. But it's just the fact that that's what social media has been so awesome. And I would think, I mean, I'm not an artist, but... Um, just to see the, the daily life of these normal people. Yeah, right. I, I, to be honest, you know, it's, it's especially at the moment, it's been so crazy with, with the album coming out and everything else. I don't get to spend as much time as I would love to, you know, answering people and commenting back. There was a time when I was busking, I would, I would message every single message back. I would spend an oh. hour a day on Facebook and just, just making sure I, I kept up on that. And, and dude, I, I tried to keep on doing it for as long as I could. And it just got to the point where I was like, I can't, I can't <laughs> yeah. do this anymore. Like I'm, I've literally not seen my family for nine months, but I love it, man. I love that. And, and, and what, a, again, a bit like, you know, we were talking about, you know, how music is consumed now. What an exciting time that artists are completely in touch with their fan base. You know, there's, yeah. no, there's no wall in between that. And I think probably they used to be. Well, there's also no wall, and like you said, between that music getting out there. Have you ever, at three or four in the morning, uploaded something to push out on Spotify and iHeart and all these apps, and then went, 
Oh, f- hold on. I got to pull <laughs> that back. Have you ever had one of those moments? No, thankfully, I, I, I don't gen- generally upload myself. I think that would be a very... Um... But you can, though. That's scary, right? <laughs> it's quite scary. <laughs> what I have, what I've wanted to do, and I didn't, I, I was drunk playing guitar a little while ago. I was like, I, I might just go live. I might just do a live video. I think people would really enjoy it. It's so real. And I'm so glad I didn't. My, I think my mate was like, mate, I love you, but you're not looking your best and actually not sounding your greatest. Why don't you do it tomorrow when you're sobered up a bit? And yeah, thank God he was there because otherwise it could have been uh, a bit of a car. Call. That would have been amazing. Yeah, it would have been It would have been funny for anybody who happened to be online at that time and just, just caught it, yeah. But that is the downside to having all this ability to upload onto a podcast or music or all that stuff. I guess so. Or, I guess so. Yeah, there's a, there's a great responsibility that comes with it. One button on Instagram that says live, and there you go. Yeah, that's probably yeah. not very smart. For sure. Um, yeah. uh, this album, man, um, it's it's so cool. And even from the artwork on the front, I mean, you use a clown on here, which is like the most extreme, like an unhappy clown. Is that the most extreme way of showing unhappiness? A clown who is known to be the happy, the happiest person in the world. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a really powerful image, isn't it? And it really is. Yeah. For, for me, clowns make a lot of people uncomfortable, right? I mean, even before the whole like Joker phenomenon over the last few years, I think pe- a lot of people are kind of scared slash uncomfortable around clowns and. I think the reason is that, you know, you're never really sure what's going on with them. They've got the, the face paint, they've got the mask, they've got the, the show. But in the eyes, you can always kind of see like, are you all right? You know, are you okay? And I I felt like, you know, that this this album, Songs for the Drunk and Broken Hearted, I think, I think there's something in it where when you're going through a really rough time, when you're going through a really sort of sad time and there's this kind of external pressure and potentially internal as well to make it look like everything's fine and to make and to kind of protect. Maybe it's a very British thing as well. We're very sort of like measured, even in sort of times of crisis. It's a bit like, no, 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 everything's cool. And it just felt to me like that was a really good representation of that. You know, this, this clown who's kind of paid to make people laugh and put on a show and whatever. But, you know, this image is kind of captured in it this really low moment on his own the wigs off whiskey bottle in hand and there's something really poignant about it i think i was reading too that you dropped a few songs from this album as well what what happens to those songs now that you got rid of there's like a couple like three or three songs or so yeah it's a good question uh they lied i mean it wasn't that they were bad songs i think sometimes when you record an album you go in with a bunch of songs and it's weird. Sometimes the ones that you think are going to be super easy and come out super, super well don't. And the ones that you're kind of, you know, a bit more tentative about turn out to be the, 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 the crackers. So these ones, I think if I'd have had to release this album in May, as, as was planned, they would have, they would have been on it and it would have been fine. I think cause I just had that extra few months to live with it, to listen to it. And I just had to be honest with myself. I was like, every time these three songs come on, I'm just not as excited, you know, and because I was writing so much in lockdown, including Sword from the Stone, which is the new single, and I'd written that song and I was like, man, there's something really special about this. We just decided, like, you know what, I think it's going to be a much better record if we add these three and take these three off. And those three songs will definitely find a life somewhere, for sure. They'll, they'll turn up on an album later on or they'll be, you know, sort of um, bonus tracks along the line. But yeah, I think it's a really important thing, to be honest when you're making music, you know, you can absolutely take shortcuts and phone it, phone it in, in moments you can, but I've learned after making so many albums and sometimes making those decisions, even years afterwards, when you listen to that record, you're like track four, why did I do it? I knew at the time it wasn't right. You're your own worst critic though, aren't you? I mean, you're the, you're the last person to really ask, which I also saw that you actually play it for other artists as well to say what you think. So that's, yeah. Who are you playing it for, by the way? The main one is 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 Ed's. I mean, we've been friends for years and years, and you know he's been extraordinarily generous to me over the years. You know, taking me out on tour and um, as a support act and championing my music to to anyone who will listen, really. And uh, yeah, when I when I wrote Sword from the Stone, I, I sent it to him because we often send each other, you know, just phone demos or whatever. Um, 
And he got back to me after like seven minutes and was like, dude, this is, there's something, there, there's really something with this. Mm. And so he ended up actually going away and, and producing a version of it. It's called the gingerbread mix, mm -hmm. which I believe is, is the one that you guys are playing. Um, and it, it's so cool, man. It's what an absolute privilege to have someone like Ed Sheeran, you know, produce a track uh, for you. Um, so it's, uh, I feel very lucky in that regard. Especially to, uh, because you said that's your your favorite song on there, probably you know, and yeah. which is interesting as well, because that's the first song on the album, isn't it? It is. That is that is that kind of like, hey, I'm gonna hit him right away with this song that I love. Yeah, I think I think it makes a real impact. I think it, um, I think there are so many ways you can go with a record, and I think every album is different. Sometimes you want to sort of creep in subtly. Sometimes you want to smash them as as soon as they put it on. Um, so yeah, it just felt like a great opener. It felt like a really good way of setting the tone for the for the rest of the record. Yeah. Now the Ed version is, uh, it's it. There are some differences. I mean, my immediate one is it gets in faster, like right away. For sure, for sure. And I and I, and it's something that we talked about. You know, like the music I make generally. I mean, Let Her Go was an anomaly. The music I make left to my own devices can be catchy, can be whatever, but but isn't necessarily the right aesthetic for, you know, commercial radio and 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 that kind of world. Ed is a pop genius. Mm -hmm. And I think he got so excited about this song and he was like, mate, honestly, like we could do something really exciting with this. And I'm totally up for it. And I think, you know, at this stage of my career, I'm not precious about it. You know, I'm 13 albums in, I'm very confident with who I am musically uh, and what I do. And yeah, it was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's have some fun with it. And the whole idea was it, it would be a bit punchier, a bit poppier. Basically, he, he was going to Sheeranize it. And uh, that, was, that was something we were both aware of and, and I was very happy about it. And, he, and, pro, and for programming as well, programmers must love it because it's, it's definitely a shorter song. So it's a... Uh... It's a shorter song. It's, it, yeah, and it, and it lends itself more to that world. And look, you know, I'm sure some people will, will have will have trouble with that decision making process that or I've sold out or whatever else. It for me it's just like, look, this is a really catchy song and I really want to give it a great shot of radio and a great shot of reaching lots of people. And Ed wants to work on it. I mean, like at that stage, it's like, yeah, let's do this. It's fun. It's great. What I'm getting from this song is when you're singing to the ex. Yeah. Is th this is kind of the and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is how I'm how I'm hearing it. This is like the the first communication with the ex, and you're saying, "Hey, I hope you are doing this, and I hope you're good." But that's a way of saying, "I'm not any of these things that I hope you are." First of all, but even yeah. in <laughs> right, uh, and even in the the tone of it, like the first, like the verse of it, where you're being soft and saying, "Hey, I hope you're doing good." That whole vibe, but then when it flips onto how you are. Even the music gets a little louder and more aggressive. Yeah, I think that there's something really true to that. The way I look at it is that the verses are almost like it's almost small talk. It's almost kind of awkward. It's almost like how's how's the weather? How you doing? How's your how, how's your mum? Like it's that kind of stuff that you yeah maybe like if you bump into your ex after a year, you're like um, how are you? And then the chorus explodes into this sort of like because to be honest i'm i'm a complete mess and and there's this real level of honesty there's this explosion of like vulnerability and i think the juxtaposition between the two things that kind of polite small talky like hope you're doing all right to like i'm a complete mess i think there's something powerful about that and not not just from a breakup point of view i think there's a real lockdown feel to this song as well you know up and down like a yo-yo and, and time going fast and then slow i think everyone can relate to that after the year we've we've all had yeah for sure and even the roller coaster not only of emotion but also of the chord progression because this like you said these small talk the chords on it are kind of happy but then on the yeah. hook when you talk about yourself even yeah. even the melt the uh the chords and stuff are a little darker a little sadder yeah yeah for sure it's it's really interesting talking about it it's, it's lovely to get sort of outside perspective on it but yeah it's 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 a song that i wrote you know i write a lot of songs and i like most of them but every now and again there's one that i i just had as soon as i went to that chorus when i was writing it i just got goosebumps and it was just like this that i know that this is something special I, I feel it whether it goes on to be crazy mega hit or not like 
I'm so proud of this song. I, I feel like it's um, the best I can do, actually. Uh, I'll just tell you, too, the part that really hit me the most um, was after all of that, the place where the bridge would normally be. Everything just, for lack of a better term, just freaks out and it double yeah. times and, and yeah. just the, the fact that the beat double times and it's just a uh, a complete mess in in the mind yeah that was that was a that was a sheer in addition i mean so there's there's two versions of this so so there's the album version which is much more in keeping with the rest of the record and then yeah ed ed added that kind of breakbeat kind of it's almost like it's almost dare i say it, it's almost sort of drum and bassy kind of thing very it's like that jungle yeah. the jungle drum and bass stuff. yeah exactly which is which is something i never thought would be on one of my tracks and when i heard it the first time i was like that's so cool <laughs> like it's really exciting yeah and you know it's really important as well to push yourself as a musician not just live in your comfortable little world of kind of acoustic guitars and 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 folk and you know acoustic playlists it's like actually yeah do try something different do do push it a little bit in whatever way that that may be i think it's a really healthy thing to do yeah i, I would even that part could even be longer for me because it's it's like 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 i say encompassing that whole feeling but also the fact that it is the drum and bass drum jump sound but it's still the soft music over it and that's yeah. where you your mind is going what's happening right now there's this yeah it's this and this which on paper should not work together but it is so uh attractive to listen cool. to and that's the part awesome. one of those parts i was speaking on earlier you have to keep rewinding it that's awesome i will pass that on to ed i'm sure he'll be very touched to hear that the only thing i hate about it is that i can't talk at the beginning of it about it because there's no intro on a damn thing yeah that's true that's true <laughs> You know, but but you can never please everyone with Let Her Go. The thing that everybody got annoyed at me about was the end bit where I kind of go a cappella. And because I didn't even think it was ever going to get on the radio, I left that really long pause at the end. Only know your lover when you let her go. And then it's like a year. <laughs> and you let her go. And yes. every radio DJ around the world was just like, what are you doing, dude? Like, yeah. Why is everything quiet? Why is it dead space? Yeah, it's like this panic globally. So uh, I've learned my lesson with that one. 